Um, <clears throat> this morning, we're going to be looking at a very big topic, and we are not going to cover it all. It's impossible. Um, this is one of the reasons that I have difficulty with topical messages, because no matter which topic you think you're starting down on, you always end up hitting a hundred others along the way. And it can then go from being a one moment of a topic or a word study to being more and more and more. And soon you've just taught the whole Bible. And yeah, it can be quite exhaustive. <laughs> Uh, so it is difficult to rein in a topic to just hit only one uh, specific thing. This morning, we're going to be considering the word worship. It keeps popping. <laughs> That's distracting. Okay. Let's set it on the... Maybe that'll do. Nope. Off. I'll just have to talk louder. Okay. <clears throat> we'll be looking at the topic of worship and the word worship. And even just mentioning that word causes some people to rejoice and other people to cringe. It Probably, maybe not your first thought, but surely in the first couple of thoughts you had, you thought praise and worship. That phrase, because it is used so often, um, will have entered your thoughts. And yet, when we look at worship in the Bible, we will see that while praise should be worshipful, worship is not equal to praise. Worship in fact, has very little to do with praise. You can praise, rightfully so, people, things, or even God without being worshipful, and it still be correct and biblical. It is also possible to worship God without ever opening your mouth. And so we will see here that these two terms, while they do touch on each other, they often today get replaced for each other. And I admit, I'm one of the people who does that. How many times have I been talking about, oh, we're going to sing a song and let's worship God together. And I'm using it meaning let's praise, let's sing, and not meaning an attitude of the heart. So let us look at what it means to worship. We could look at the dictionary definition, and we will later, but first, I want us to see the first mentions of worship in the Old Testament. So we'll begin in Genesis chapter 22. And we will see how it is used. Because this is how the people in the New Testament would have regarded this word worship. What it would have meant to them when they heard this word. They wouldn't have thought praise and worship, praise and worship team. They wouldn't have thought singing necessarily. This is what they would have been thinking about. In Genesis chapter 22 and in verse 5. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. If we continue to read on and we will skip down a little bit, we will not find one word about singing or about praise. Instead, Abraham's intention, as is stated in verse 9, is to build an altar, lay the wooden order, and bind up Isaac his son and lay him upon the wood. He intended to sacrifice. This was worship. And now if we go to Exodus chapter 34, let us see worship again in action. Exodus chapter 34. 
and we will re review the promise made in starting in, cha in chapter 34, verse 10. We'll read down um, through verse 14. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among whom which thou art shall see the work of God, the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I will drive, sorry, behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite, the Canaanite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, and the Hittite, and the Jebusite. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, cut down their groves, for thou shalt worship no other god, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. We have here God being worshipped. That's the command. Thou shalt worship no other God but God. You're going, it is possible for people to worship at idols, to build up altars to others. And it is rightly called worship, but it is not correct. It is not good. We see here that worship can be good or bad. If we perform worship with the incorrect object, it is bad. It is wrong. And God warns the people of Israel not to worship other gods. This might sound familiar because this is one of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt have no other graven images before me, etc. But here it actually uses the word worship as the explanation by Moses to the people of Israel on what it means to worship their God. They're not to worship other gods. They're not to build up altars to those other gods. And now if we go to Deuteronomy chapter 4, and we won't go through every instance of worship in the Bible because there are over 150 of them. Um, there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot. Uh, but this will give us a taste. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, And in verse 19. <clears throat> and lest thou lift up thine eyes unto heaven, and when thou seest the sun, the moon, the stars, even all the hosts of heaven, shouldst be driven to worship them, and serve them, which the Lord thy God hath divided unto all nations under the heaven. It is possible to worship inanimate objects. It's possible to worship things. This is, again, something God is warning the people of Israel not to do. But it is possible to worship them. And in what kind of worship do we see that they are having? Again, it is not merely singing songs. It's not lighthearted. It's very serious. We have that they are making images, they are looking up at things, and they are worshiping them, they are serving them. They are worshiping and serving. This connection between worship and service are, is actually one that you will find repeated over and over and over again throughout this, the um, study of this word, worship. In fact, you find serving and worshiping in more verses together than you ever do praise and worship. Worship and service are very closely tied together. What kind of service could you do to serve heavens, sun, moon, stars, host of heaven? We all know that there are people who 
um, pay attention to the astrologers and the astronomers and they say, oh, this is the kind of day it is and the, it's five o'clock in the morning, therefore do this because, you know, the sun is telling me to do this or it's this particular month and therefore this is your, um, this is your personality and all of that. This worship of these things that are given to us by God is very destructive and it causes us to do actions in response to what we perceive the stars are telling us to do. Again, this is not correct. This is an evil worship, but it shows us what it means to worship. To worship something is to serve it, to listen for what you are supposed to do and then to obey. We will come back to that point as we continue on in this study. Our final preparatory one before we get to the definition here is in Deuteronomy chapter 8. Only a few pages over. We find that for the people of Israel, it was possible to turn back. In Deuteronomy 8, 19, it says, And it shall be, if thou do at all, forget the Lord thy God, and walk after other gods, and serve them, and worship them. I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. We had previously that it was something that God did not want. Don't do this. Don't worship other gods. Don't make any graven images. But here we find out the kind of penalty, the anger that God will feel if we worship other gods. Ye shall surely perish if ye, if you worship and serve other gods. We find a third point, and this is again another set of words that is all often connected with worship. It says, and walk after other gods. To walk after means to consider your path, to follow the direction or leadership of someone. It is to walk in a manner that, um, yeah, we use this, this phrase a lot, that you walk after the manner that you were saved. You walk after, like a Christian. You talk like a Christian. This is also connected with worship very closely that we walk after God, not after other gods. If we continued in Deuteronomy, we would find a place for turning back to God and how one might do that. But notice, even if you started out serving God, walking after him, worshiping him, it is possible to get detoured in your path and begin to walk after, serve, and then finally to worship other gods. None of us are immune from this. All of us must be careful that our worship is good. Now, we come to the definition. What is worship? And I said we would go to a uh, definition from the dictionary, but we will do it by looking at Psalm chapter 95 and verse 6, because we have the very words in the dictionary um, used for this particular uh, word, worship. Psalm 96 and verse 6. Sorry, ni Psalm 95 and verse 6. Hope I didn't say it the wrong way around. <clears throat> This is the cry of the psalmist, Psalm 95 and verse 6. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Worshiping means to bow down oneself, to kneel before, to make obeisance to, to honor and revere someone. In the Old Testament, there are actually six different words that are used that are translated, sorry, 
worship in the King James Version. All of them have to, to do with bowing down or putting your face to the ground or um, worshiping, oh, sorry, worshiping, honoring someone who is of great importance like a king or a god, someone that you are looking to for direction, someone whose control reaches down to your very life. That is, whether you have life or death is in their hands and you worship before them because it is only at their mercy you may continue. This is what it means to worship. Worship is to bow down oneself, to kneel before the Lord. This is an attitude of humility. This does not mean that we must come to church and then each take a knee, etc. It is not that physical action that causes worship. It is the heart attitude of coming before God as the one that we are responsible to. Coming to him in, say, in humility and saying, I am not worthy to even look at you. I am not worthy to be eye level with you. This is worship. Bowing ourselves before God to declare his great worth and our unworth. That's not a word, but it fits. Our lack of worth and his great worth and recognizing that distinction. And this is worship. That is what true worship is. And so, yes, it is true that you can praise God and worship at the same time. But I would submit to you that a lot of singing and a lot of praising to God does not include worship. And in fact, it does not always need to include worship. When we are praising God, we do not necessarily have to recognize our own worthlessness, nor bow ourselves down before him in order to lift him up. There are many psalms that do both. And there are many psalms that just do the one, praising God for all the wonderful things that he has done and never mentioning our own position in response to that. This is what worship means, to bow down. In Greek, there is only one word that is translated worship, so that makes that a lot more easy. And again, it means to bow down, to kneel in front of or to make obeisance in front of someone or something. That is what it means, the word itself. Let us look at an example of it in the New Testament. And this will be a passage that we're all familiar with because it is one that has been read recently. Matthew. Chapter 1, oh sorry, Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1. Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and are come to worship him. Now I just want to notice that even though these men studied the stars and they were directed by the stars they were not coming to worship the stars they were coming to worship him that is jesus the one the stars had told them about this is a very different thing than worshiping the stars so they've come to worship jesus this word worship here and then let us see what it is that they did um, well, actually, we'll jump down to verse 8 and see what Herod said. He said the exact same thing. He said, um, when ye have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. Now let's drop down. In verse 11, we have the wise men coming into the place where Jesus is, and this is their response and this is their worship what they're intending to do to worship him and when they were come into the house they saw the young child with mary his mother and fell down 
and worshiped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. They worshiped Jesus falling down in front of him. They bowed themselves to him. They claimed him, as it were, king of their life. And they offered him tribute, gifts. Um, that word gifts there is also the word tribute, which kings and nations give to other nations to, when they have been conquered. And so here, these wise men have come to Jesus and they claim that he has conquered them. They bow in front of him and that is their worship of him. So we've seen the technical definition of worship, but how does it work out in our lives? Uh, we've already hinted at this, seeing how it was used in uh, Genesis, Exodus, and Deuteronomy. We are called to worship God, and worship is not something that you can do just by a action. It is not merely a particular form of bowing. In Japan, they have particular forms of bowing, you know, and you have to do it just so. And there's, there have been people who have counted the numbers of times that uh, businessmen in Japan will bow every day, and it's huge numbers. In their lifetime, 20, 30,000 times. And you're like, that's, that's crazy, a crazy amount of respect that they're giving. But it is not that action alone that causes it to be worshipful towards God. That is the outward expression of an inward difference. If we go now to John chapter 4, and we'll spend a, a few minutes here looking at John chapter 4. Jesus is speaking to the woman at the well, and she tried to distract him by bringing up religious controversy. And I'm sure you've met people like that. Um, they delight in a bit of controversy and don't delight in God's word. And so she was bringing up a little bit of religious controversy to try and stop uh, Jesus in what he was saying. And her question was whether the Israelites in Jerusalem were correct or whether the Samaritans in Samaria were correct about where to worship God. And we see in verse 23, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Your spirit is not a physical thing that can bow down. A physical action of bowing at the waist does not create a change in your soul. But it is that attitude in the soul of worshiping God, that is what must happen for worship to be correct. It must bow itself down. It must acknowledge God to be king and ruler. I'm not talking merely about lordship, although that is true as well. And that touches on it. Again, another aspect where a topic can lead you down every passage in the Bible. Um, we're not talking specifically about lordship here, although that is true and something that we must understand as Christians that Jesus is Lord in our life. But when we worship him, we are acknowledging that it is by his grace that we exist. It is by his power that we go forth. We don't leave his presence to do his will without him telling us. If you picture in your mind a medieval castle and you have the king standing there and you have someone coming up and bowing down in front of him, 
and then being sent off on a mission to do something. That person then rises up and they go out not as themselves, but as his herald, as his messenger. And from that point, they are him. They are on behalf of the king speaking. And this is the same for us. If we truly are worshiping God, then every action, every word should be in service of God. That does bring us to another word that often gets confused. Uh, service. We say we're at church service, but we kind of mean that in the we're sitting here and we're being waited on sort of mentality, or we're waiting on other people, we're helping people to um, the word of God. This is what we mean, but that is not a good way of looking at church. Church is when we gather together. Church is when we come together to worship God, that is bring ourselves to God's feet, bow down before him, and then go forth with our marching orders. That is what church should be, and it truly should be service, service in the manner of us each serving one another by giving one another the truth, by challenging one another's thinking that we can closer walk with God. That is how it is to be service. Again, another topic for another day. <laughs> um, we have here worship. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. It is not an outward thing. It is not an emotional thing. It is our spirits being in line with God's and bowing down, recognizing that difference between God, who is almighty, all-powerful, wonderful, good, holy, just, we can go on, and us who are in all way lacking to meet up to that standard. And so bowing ourselves in humility, recognizing we are not worthy of God. We are not worthy to be in his presence. It is only that he has allowed us in his presence. We've dealt with this uh, message to the woman at the well and as we've been going through the book of Luke, so we won't go any further into uh, the meaning of this passage. Instead, we will go now to uh, sorry, Psalm chapter 29. And again, I hope your fingers are limbered up for this one today. We've got a lot of passages to go to and we probably won't get to the, all, them all. <laughs> Psalm 29 and verse 2. Helps when I turn to the right page. <clears throat> Psalm 29 and verse 2. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Now remember, this is worship as the people of Israel understood it. This is not singing. This is not praise necessarily. This is bowing down before the Lord. This is coming to his temple to bring their sacrifices. Here we are to worship the Lord, but we are to worship him in the beauty of holiness. Now I'm not going to solve for you whether this is saying we need to have on the holy garments, that is, garments that are free from sin, or whether this is saying that holiness itself is how we worship, that's for you to study. Because again, it would take all month <laughs> to get through it. Uh, just know that this particular phrase, worshiping the Lord and the beauty of holiness, occurs at least three more times uh, in Psalms and also in Chronicles. So this phrase is not a one-off. This is truly how we ought to come before God. When we accept Jesus as Christ and Savior, uh, Lord of our life, he washes away our sins through his blood. And we truly come into his presence 
with garments made white, holy, acceptable unto him. And it is true, as we are told in Titus, that Jesus has purchased for himself a peculiar people, that he wants to present to himself spotless. And in Revelation, we are told that Jesus is working to bring his church before him as a bride, spotless, that is holy, presentable, and that is how we ought to come in our worship, is holy. Whether it is holiness itself, which is worship, or whether our attitude and actions need to be holy in order for our worship to be appropriate in the presence of the king, we must have an eye towards holiness in our worship. And we could go on in 1 Corinthians and look that we are to do all to the glory of God. And so whatever worship is, it must bring glory to God in some manner. It must not be detracting from his glory. We are also called to do worship in front of others. And again, we don't have time to go through all of these. Uh, we're going to finish up in Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8. <clears throat> and they shall spread them, uh, sorry, in verse 2, Jeremiah 8 and verse 2. And they shall spread them before the sun, the moon, and all the host of heaven, whom they have loved and whom they have served and after whom they have walked, and whom they have sought, and whom they have worshipped, they shall not be gathered nor buried, they shall be for dung upon the face of the earth. This is a promise by Jeremiah against the inhabitants of Jerusalem who have not followed God, who have not worshipped God, and he's describing how they will be uh, displayed in shame in front of the entire earth. But notice how they have followed these stars and hosts of heaven. First, they loved them. And then they served them. And then they walked after them. And then they sought them. And to sum it all up, they worshipped them. They bowed down before them. When we worship God, we must worship him, loving him, for letting us in. We should serve him with our whole hearts. We should walk after his ways. That is, allow him to direct every step that we take. Whether it is to go to the left hand or go to the right, whether it's to go a little bit faster or a little bit slower, we need to walk following God. We need to seek after God. These people had been seeking all of the wrong things. We need to seek God. And finally, when we then bow down before God, our worship will be real because from our hearts, it's real. You cannot worship God if you do not love him. You can, cannot worship him in this life unless you are willing to serve him and follow his directions. You must seek him and you must bow down before him. I would uh, recommend a study on worship and look at all of the verses that deal with worship, how we must worship with an attitude of fear from Psalm 22. That our worship often involves confessing God from Nehemiah chapter 9. And so many more passages. 
But if we wanted to sum it up in one verse, let us worship God as much as these people had worshipped their false idols. And we will be way away from praise and worship as you can possibly get. <laughs> we will be way away from uh, a flippant, half-hearted worship. And considering the number of times that worship is mentioned in the Bible, it is important. It's an important topic. It is not merely to say, oh, God is good, and to say, God's done some wonderful things for me, but instead to bow our hearts, to turn our attention to our own worthlessness and to God's unending and perfect worth. That should be one of our great challenges, one of our great uh, joys. Are you ready to worship God today? If, if we were to make a call today and say, will you worship God right now? Would your heart say yes? Or would you have any thoughts of your own worth that would stop you? Would any thoughts of what others might think pull you back? Would any other worship that you do from day to day of, you know, your, your favorite sports team or that thing that you like the most, you know, the best piece of equipment ever made, whatever it is, that thing that you feel yourself to be unworthy of and that you put on that pedestal in front of you, that thing are, is that what will hold you back from worshiping God. Because service walking, seeking, all of these things are of little worth if we do not have that attitude of worship mixed in. They're all tied together. When in Acts we are told that the people followed the apostles' doctrine, I always wondered why did it just say doctrine, not doctrines? It's because they all tie together. <laughs> You can't have worship without also having holiness. And as you saw, all of those things, they all tie together. It's not the doctrine of this and the doctrine of that, but you have to have all of it together. You can't separate it out easily. It wasn't Paul preaching this one, one doctrine and Peter preaching this other doctrine. It was they were all preaching doctrine, the doctrine of Jesus Christ. They were all preaching the one doctrine one body of teaching, and it all hangs together. You cannot be a good Christian without worship. Let us not be afraid of worship, the word or what it means, else in a generation people will not be worshiping the way we do. They will call something worship, and it will be something very different. Let's close with a word of prayer.